Hi, Alison Martin here from Gardening by Design, talking about wildlife, well-being and gardening and how all three fit together for everybody's benefit. UK wildlife is struggling, like wildlife across much of the globe, for reasons such as habitat loss and historically unsympathetic land management or agricultural practices. But things are changing and understanding is growing about the importance of biodiversity and the cause and effect of man's actions. And we are also beginning to understand that gardens can be extremely good news. If you look across the UK, gardens occupy 5% of the land mass, which it may not sound a lot, but it is greater than the area of nature reserves which are dedicated to the protection of wildlife. So we simply cannot leave wildlife in nature reserves and hope that that's enough. And the other good thing about gardens is that gardens are everywhere and gardens are everywhere that nature reserves are not. In order to understand why gardens can be so important, let's have a look at this rather weird diagram. So the green circles are nature reserves and you, it's easy to understand how in that concentrated area, although it's quite small across the country, you have a large population, they're protected, they're dedicated and managed for wildlife. And we can also easily imagine that the darker green ring around the outside is where wildlife can spill over into parks and gardens and countryside and what have you. But what about a garden? So when it comes to a garden, let's have a look. This little yellow dot, for example, might represent my garden or your garden. It isn't a huge area like a nature reserve and it may be a long way from each. So really, the question is, what good can it do? How am I going to get wildlife into my garden? What's it going to contribute in such a small area? Which is true, but if that yellow dot is mine or yours, uh, you look around the room or you look at your friends and family, everybody, all, everybody who has a house, everybody who has a house and a garden has a yellow dot. So if we look at them all together, you can see that firstly, there are a lot more, you get a lot larger area, but also what's happening here is that those gardens and the school gardens and the grounds and the parks are joining up the nature reserves. And this is where they become so important to enable populations to spread, to expand, but also to link together populations. So you, you get a, gr a greater diversity of the genetics and you don't get a small isolated population on its own that then begins to die out. So there are two key ways that gardens can make a real difference to wildlife. The first is in supporting what's already there, because whether you really encourage wildlife or whether you even want it or not, there will be creatures living in your garden. They just appear from the surrounds. So gardens, in fact, can be better than countryside, particularly agricultural countryside, because we can support existing populations through cold weather, with food in the winter, for example, for the birds, through drought in the summer by putting out water, and thereby we can support a sort of higher density of numbers. Gardens can have habitats and planting and food to really help keep those numbers up through tough times. And the second way is by providing these corridors, reaching the creatures that are within range, that walk through, that fly over, and by providing them with habitats and food, uh, we are helping to link those separate populations together. I'm often asked about the challenge of supporting wildlife and fitting in the amenity that we need in our garden, particularly in a small urban space. So families need space to play and sit and entertain and grow vegetables, but they also may want to support wildlife. And that can be a challenge, but the reality is not everyone will have the same balance of that throughout their lives. Everything we do for wildlife in the garden is a step forward. Every small action we take that anybody takes, balanced with the functionality and the space they want in their own garden is a step in the right direction. Because the bottom line is that gardens only work for wildlife if they work for the people who live there too. If you don't love your garden, you'll get frustrated. If you look out and see things you don't want, long grass where you need space to play, all of that stuff, it will undermine. And over time, there becomes a resentfulness and there's the temptation to sweep it all away and just give up. The gardener has to work for the family 
and then they can love the wildlife too. And that is because gardening is all about well-being. Now gardening for well-being and specifically the use of horticulture as a therapy to support mental and physical health is a whole nother topic. But at a very simple level, if you just ask yourself, what do you like about gardens and gardening? Whether that's visiting gardens, sitting in the garden, or actually getting out there, working and creating a garden. And if I ask a room full of people, I get similar sorts of answers around uh, satisfaction, of creating something beautiful, having a lovely space for the family and friends to congregate, satisfaction of growing vegetables, just a sense of achievement, a sense of being able to manage it and that having your own space and also calm a sanctuary, whether that's your own garden or an allotment. And all of those reasons, when you come down to what is gardening for, gardening in our own gardens for leisure purposes is simply about improving our quality of life. And at the bottom line, it is about well-being. So having had a look at how wildlife is struggling and gardens can potentially help, let's do the same around our mental well-being. These are statistics from before the COVID pandemic uh, and the situation certainly hasn't improved. But approximately one in four people in the UK will experience a mental health problem each year. And that is one for which they seek help uh, and may need long term support. In England, one in six people report themselves experiencing a common mental health problem such as anxiety or depression in any given week. These are potentially less serious conditions um, that may come and go. But that's an awful lot. And so clearly anything that we can do within our own lives as prevention to support men our mental well-being and early intervention that is going to be a good thing. Along with other medical and psychosocial support, uh, there have been many studies, particularly over the last 10 years, but, but before that as well, into the role of nature uh, in mental health around biophilia and particularly looking at gardening projects because of all the forms of nature intervention. Those have been the most frequently run, the most common projects. Uh, many people will have heard of things like prison garden projects uh, and this started way back in the 1940s. One of the reports that pulled this together fairly recently, Natural England produced a report in 2016 which reviewed academically um, a whole raft of nature-based interventions for mental health. Uh, so these are organised projects rather than gardening in our own in our own backyards, but the findings are equally applicable. And they found that people gain significant well-being benefits from an active connection with nature and meaningful nature-based activity, particularly in a social setting. And that's helpful where people are drifting into social isolation, uh, losing contact with their community and all sorts of uh, well-being mental health issues that that can lead to. And of course, the specific benefits vary from project to project and person to person. But there were consistent themes around um, reduction in stress, improved cognition, better sleep from being outdoors, sense of achievement, sense of fulfillment and, as I say, connection to a community. And these are really mirrored by the sorts of reasons when I ask people, why do you like gardening? What is it you like about gardens? These things become very similar. And of course, I would suggest gardening, wouldn't I? But one of the advantages of gardening is the level, the, the, the meaningful activity, the active connection with nature. So a great de-stressing activity, great relaxing, is going for a walk out in the countryside, in the woods. And that does give a lot of benefits, particularly, like I say, around stress reduction. But the other raft of benefits, the wider um, advantages come from that meaningful interaction and the more we interact with nature also the more we we care about it and this leads us back round rather nicely into gardening for wildlife gardening supporting wildlife enabling us to redouble if you like our connection with nature not just the plants but the creatures as well and that association that understanding that we are part of nature as well uh, 
in overall increases people's tendency to want to protect the environment and to get engaged. So let us get back to the nitty gritty of wildlife gardening and what we can do. The really good news is, of course, that, as I've already said, wildlife is already in your garden. Any green space, almost any space, will have some creatures living in it. They just appear naturally. The really good news is the most important thing is to take the first step to, to tolerate the creatures that are there to begin to watch and begin to appreciate and then we move on the next step is to start encouraging more and supporting but the very first step to move away from what's probably now a rather 20th century view of, of gardening for some people where the 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 the, the, the creepy crawlies were all reviewed as pests and they were taken out the idea of a pristine garden is one that actually is just controlled totally by ourselves that's very outdated so the most important thing is to move off and tolerate the wildlife that is there naturally. And once people start getting engaged with wildlife and more interested, the question, of course, comes up, well, what should I be offering? What goes in my garden, particularly if you're looking at a fairly small space? And really, there are two questions to, to answer, and that will drive what you do at the beginning when you're first starting out as a wildlife gardener. The first is what makes you happy. And the second is what's going to make the most difference, what's going to give the most benefit. So in terms of what makes you happy, it may be that it's watching the birds. You may want to see, we're talking about pollinators today, so bees and butterflies as well. It may be that some people develop a much more specific interest into amphibians, dragonflies, bats, moths, or whatever. It absolutely doesn't matter. So focus on what makes you happy, because that is the garden that you will love and that will benefit you as well. The second question on what makes the most difference is what creatures are already there, what, what's visiting and what is likely to visit, what's in the area, what can come in through those corridors. And that requires a little bit of more thought about exactly where your garden is. And this really means being firstly completely realistic, but also not picking and choosing particularly. It isn't about I want to attract certain wildlife to my garden. We absolutely have to go with what's already there. So I live in the southeast of England. And although the sort of poster boys of wildlife conservation in the UK, the very popular animals, red squirrels, golden eagles and these things that we all hear about are wonderful. There is absolutely no chance realistically that where I live, I will ever see wild red squirrels or golden eagles so this is an extreme example isn't it but whatever I do I am going to be disappointed so the idea is to focus on what is around and what you genuinely are likely to be able to support. There have not been that many long-term studies of wildlife in domestic gardens but this is an interesting one over a 30-year period a householder in Leicester recorded the different species that visited of course, at different times across that period, not all at the same time, um, their garden was described as wildlife friendly, but not dedicated, not devoted to wildlife for the exclusion of family space and growing flowers and vegetables. And you can see a really good range here. 50 plus birds, I probably expect those to be much greater than, than, than the mammals, for example. But what's clear is 2000 plus species of insects and other invertebrates. So plenty of scope for wildlife coming into our gardens that we can get interested in um, but do be prepared for the majority of it to have either zero or more than six legs or six plus legs um, and be insects and invertebrates because these of course are the bottom of the food chain a shocking statistic is that 41 percent of insects are endangered globally and no reason for the uk to be outside of this trend and that matters, that matters to us, and not just because insects are the bottom of the food chain and if you lose populations of insects, then obviously the whole food web of the higher creatures begins to collapse. But also because bottom line is 75% of our food crops are insect pollinated, uh, so you don't get the crops if you're, they're not pollinated. Um, in addition to which, 87% of all plants are insect pollinated. So even the ones we don't use for food, we use for other things or part of the, um, the whole biodiversity and the ecosystem. Um, so let's have a bit of a closer look at the pollinators that are so important in our gardens. I think most people would identify bees as pollinators. That's widely known. But there are lots of other insects, the adult forms of flying insects that collect pollen and nectar from flowers 
anything that goes from flower to flower collecting pollen and nectar will move the pollen onto the next flower they visit and becomes a pollinator and particularly groups such as hoverflies, wasps and butterflies and moths as well. Hoverflies and wasps, there are hundreds, 240, 250 species of each that you are, that are able to inhabit that may be found in a UK garden pollinating. So they are really important groups and it's definitely worth having perhaps a slightly different attitude, particularly to wasps. Uh, than we've had in the past. Butterflies and moths, I think, are clearly always going to be very popular creatures. And there may be some surprises even when it comes to bee pollinators. So the honeybee, bottom left in the picture here, there is one species of honeybee, uh, Euro the European honeybee, uh, and that does pollinate. But more important are both bumblebees, uh, about 25 species in the UK, six of which are fairly common in gardens, certainly in the southeast here. Um, different coloured um, tails on the bumblebees, and that's how you differentiate them. And solitary bees, so things like leafcutter bees and mining bees, and these sort of bees that you see using particularly the bee and bug hotels that we have in our gardens, in the, putting a single egg into the tube and then blocking it up. Those solitary bees, again, 200 over, well over 200 different species of solitary bee in the UK, very important pollinators. And of course, pollinators need flowers and they need flowers right through a really long season. Many of these pollinating insects overwinter and hibernate, they emerge sometimes as early as February. You'll see big queen bumblebees coming out in February, certainly here in the southeast of the UK, looking for pollen and nectar for that first feed right the way through to the end of the year. So these winter flowers, early flowering spring bulbs, Moving on into summer, that's a little bit easier to have beautiful flower borders in summer. The, the crucial thing for all sorts of these insects, though, is to have a whole range of different colours of flower that attract different species of insect, but also different shapes and sizes. So a bumblebee will crawl up into the big tubular flower of a foxglove or a penstemon. Butterflies sit on, we all have the butterfly bush, the buddleia, and put their tongues down into these tiny little tubular flowers clustered together. So big range of shapes and sizes and colours of flowers. They're great for the insects as well as for us. And moving on into autumn, the flowers that last on into autumn, you can see here these uh, the rudbeckia, the cone shaped flowers, really prominent cone where the pollen and the nectar sit um, and those go right through towards the winter. You will have noticed a lot of the flowers in those previous pictures were not native, they're not our wildflowers, they're introduced species and that is because the adult pollinating insects feed on any flower that is the right shape and is out at the right time and will provide them with pollen and nectar. So introduced exotics, ornamentals, whatever you want to call them, are very good for the adults uh, and it's often easier then to get a long season from the spring right through to early winter of flowering plants. Where native uh, species are very important is around butterflies and moths and it's the caterpillars. So it's not the adults, but it's the caterpillars when they lay their eggs on very specific native plants uh, because the butterflies are native, they've all evolved together. So they use native plants for laying their eggs and that's what the caterpillars eat. So different species of butterfly and moth have different food plants and ones that are very common are uh, the, the colourful, the painted ladies and uh, peacock butterfly group. Um, feed on stinging nettles so if you have a space where you can put them and you don't live near a piece of open ground those are very good native grasses and garlic mustard are also um, common for the sorts of butterflies that we get in our gardens of course it isn't just insects that you'll find in your garden there will be plenty of birds and joining an organized count or observation activity like the big garden bird count or similar both encourage people to discover what there is in their garden and perhaps put out food for new species and also provide very useful citizen science for people, uh, conservation organisations, counting populations and understanding what's doing well and what isn't. And remember that whilst 
man-made bird feeders can be an important supplement for food, particularly in the winter when that natural food may have been short supply. It's also very important to supply those natural sources of food and maybe more sustainable. So plants that produce berries and seeds, for example, in the winter. And also bear in mind that many of these birds will be eating insects we've already talked about the food chain and that can really help to reduce things that we perceive as pests so some of the caterpillars and some of the aphids for example if you are able to include a pond in your garden even a very small above ground pond in a big bowl or a bucket then you will very soon see a whole other dimension of wildlife appearing uh, damselflies and dragonflies for example where the larvae have to live underwater and of voracious predators and for some other underwater creatures and then crawl out when they're ready to hatch out into these beautiful adults that, uh, that fly across the garden are plants where the long thin stems emerge through through the water into the air they climb up and then hatch um, in, into the into the adults native amphibians like frogs newts and toads will also appreciate a pond but even if you don't have a pond, if it doesn't suit you, if it doesn't suit your garden, you are quite likely still to find the adults of these creatures in your garden. And you can provide support for that population by having places where the adults, which of course only enter the water during the spring season to breed, uh, by providing sheltered, cool, dark, damp places for them to hide log piles, rock piles and, and not being too tidy in the garden. And so we get on to the larger mammals higher up the food chain. Hedgehogs are probably the most popular. I often asked, how can I attract hedgehogs to my garden because people like them so much? And know that they are struggling. They're in, they are 75% uh, loss of numbers of hedgehogs recorded over the last um, few years. And it's not totally sure why that is. But certainly what is known is that they need about a two kilometre range. They'll, they'll happily wander a couple of kilometres a night. So a single garden is not going to support a hedgehog population. They may you may see them regularly, but they do need more space. So this is where this idea of corridors and linking gardens together becomes important. Certainly no real um, shortage, even in urban areas of foxes, badgers and grey squirrels. They seem to be quite well adapted. To, to living close to man and it, it's, it's quite likely that um, you will see those at some point in many many gardens. So the basic advice on what to plant in our gardens for wildlife is a long season of flowers of different types and shapes and colours. Plants are going to provide fruit and berries in the autumn, seed heads as well, <coughs> plenty of shrubs, native and otherwise evergreen which keep their leaves all through the winter and deciduous are just just as valuable um, where birds can perch and nest and providing cover along boundaries and through beds and gardens for the, the creatures that like to stay a bit more hidden and of course uh, climbers and wall shrubs so clothing not just walls but fences so softening the boundaries giving us a great display, but also another great source of flowers and fruit and providing cover, a great winter habitat, particularly for hibernating insects behind climbers on a wall. And the net effect of all of this is great, great support for wildlife. But if you think about what's what looks good in a garden to keep the garden of interest to the people all year round. Flowers, fruit, seed heads, mixture of shrubs, nicely clothed walls and fences. To be honest, this is pretty good for us too. But of course, there are plenty of choices of features and habitats and things to add to our gardens in addition simply to the planting. We've already seen pictures of bird feeders. So the question then is, what else to offer? And this brings us back to that question of balance, amenity versus wildlife. And if you only have a very small garden, you can see there a picture of a pretty small urban garden. And there are so many things that you can see if you look up in a book, listen to a talk, look on the Internet, read articles, lists and lists of things that you can have, that you must have for wildlife. Ponds, rock piles, log piles, leave the grass long, grow flowers native trees are better than ornamental trees all of these things that you can read 
and really there is a level of frustration i think from some from particularly uh, urban and, and, and new wildlife gardeners that you, that that's my garden is really small i want to sit in it i need to play in it i want to i want to grow flowers and vegetables and what have you um but i think what we need to do is look in a different way at our garden because although you might look at your garden and see the boundaries you wouldn't dream of roaming across through the back gate to sit in your next door neighbor's garden because they had a different view or they had a nice tree but wildlife doesn't look at it like that so if you look over the fence typically there's another garden next door there's another garden behind and so wildlife is looking at the overall picture literally a bird's eye view they're looking at that whole area as a habitat and that harks back to this thing about linking gardens together and making corridors small gardens together make large spaces that suit wildlife and the key thing here as i mentioned around hedgehogs is about access that uh, you don't have solid walls or fences between the gardens things like hedgehogs can get through of course birds and insects can fly over the top as well having those um, boundaries closed with either hedges or um, uh, climbers enable creatures to sort of to move between the two in safety and and part of this really leads on then to neighborhood engagement talking to your friends and neighbors getting them onto that first step that tolerating wildlife even if they're not as enthusiastic yet to try and support it and be more proactive and that's how even a small garden can really have great value and so to my final question and that is what does a wildlife garden look like pause for a moment and just think if somebody said to you here is a picture imagine a picture of a wildlife garden what would you imagine what would it look like because we do have some stereotypes of this and that's something that really i want to challenge so what is the answer for you to the question what does a wildlife garden look like and here is my answer a wildlife garden looks like whatever you want your garden to look like whatever i want my garden to look like i said at the beginning that a garden has to be good for the family and the people who live there or it won't be good for wildlife either it has to be support well-being and it has to be something that you're going to love and want to look after in the long term so whatever your garden looks like whatever it needs to contain whatever you want it to contain it can be good for wildlife so here are a few examples of gardens which may not look typically like a wildlife garden. The first one here is clearly very designed, it's quite stylized, it's achieving a certain impression. Uh, but still you can see that there are there's plenty of plants, there's plenty of cover for things to live in, there's flowers, there are uh, there's, there's, there's gravel and rocks and places for things to hide. So really quite strong in the in the wildlife sector. The next one is a bit more tricky, isn't it? Because it's much more formal. And I think the immediate reaction is you can't really have a formal garden that's great for wildlife. We have this view of things that are very naturalistic. But in fact, absolutely nothing wrong with square lines. There's a couple of little ponds here you can see at the beginning. And as long as there is um, uh, rocks or, or boards for wildlife to climb out the pond, if it falls in and doesn't get, just get stuck and drown, absolutely fine. Frogs, newts, all of these creatures will live in a square pond. It doesn't have to look naturalistic. The wildlife really doesn't care. Quite a lot of mown grass and little hedges. But if all those knot gardens and, and partitions are filled with flowers, that would really add to the value for pollinators. And of course, there's plenty of trees and shrubs around the outside. So more could be done, but I certainly wouldn't write that one off. Thirdly, we have vegetable growing. This is a garden, it could equally be an allotment. And often a few challenges people perceive with wildlife, particularly the creepy crawlers and the insects and growing vegetables, which is a big topic in its own right. But remember that if you want fruit and, and, and vegetables, courgettes in the front here, you have to have insects and pollinating insects. So certainly not, um, they're not incompatible. And finally here, just a very, perhaps a very typical urban, uh, urban suburban garden plenty of plants plenty of flowers plenty of cover again it's fairly designed it doesn't look like the naturalistic style of a garden but 
real scope for wildlife even so. So that's about it. I've spoken about gardening and the role gardening plays, supporting both wildlife and well-being, and how all three knit together so naturally to provide the benefits. And what a great spot to relax with a cup of tea. There's more information on my Gardening by Design website about how gardening supports well-being and how I can help you.